Are you exhausted from your Black Friday? Well, sit back, relax. We're going to give you a little history lesson on Stuff Rhode Island. Welcome into my state of mind. I am Dan York. I hope that you had a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday. We are not working today, and I can promise you we did not shop today. You people are crazy. Those of you who get out at 6, 7 o'clock in the morning or earlier and get online and freeze your took us off in order to be able to save a couple of bucks. It's not that I'm, you know, rich and uh, I just don't understand the philosophy and the spirit of Jesus sometimes just doesn't seem to make any sense with fighting for things off of shelves. But hey, we all experience the holidays in our own way. What's nice about programs like this when we get to pre-record them for special days is that we can expand on topics. And I have uh, been looking forward to, as I told you last week when Phil West was my guest, I've been looking forward to speaking with Phil West about his new book, which I will show you here. Phil was long with Common Cause, a good government organization. And amongst the thumbs up he got for this book was from M. Charles Bax, till you remember, as the Providence Journal political columnist. He writes, Secrets and Scandals is an astonishing book, and no one but Phil West could have written it in the long slog of the war against corruption in Rhode Island. In the fight for reform, Warren Phil West was at the epicenter, and he takes you behind the battle lines with a wealth of material and detail about the issues and the players. So this is uh, Phil's uh, third time uh, arriving here. We talked about the mayor's race a lot in the book a little bit before the election. Uh, last week we talked about the election and a little bit about the Ethics Commission, but I promised Phil that we talked long form about this book. Congratulations. Thank you. I gotta tell you, I, did I mention this to you the last time we got together? I see Phil at a press conference. Hey, I got one of the books in the car. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm thinking, okay, well, I don't mind doing a quick read on Phil's work. This is going to be a vacation book, and I'm not sure which vacation, but I have, you know, I've, I've pierced through it a couple of times because, and you can read the book that way, sort of. I mean, it is a chronology, but if you're looking for a specific topic right. on good government, like you can find it in there. Thematic chapters. So if you want to read about ethics or redistricting, you can jump and hit the ethics from one place to another, to another, to another, same separation of powers, but they're roughly interspersed chronologically. It, forgive me for asking a business question, because I'm always fascinated by this. Is there a profit model for a book that's written about the history of government, even though, well, I mean, Secrets and Scandals will titillate, no doubt, but is there a profit model well, for this? Well, there's, there's no profit model in this book. I don't know if there is a profit model, but uh, we're soon to break even, I think, on the costs of the editing and publishing and so on. So, okay. Uh, but it, but uh, Well, then it will make money over time. Over time it may, uh, but we're not there yet. Did you write it for that purpose? No. You wrote it for what purpose? I mean, this is one heck of a life's work. So you wrote it, why? Well, because I, as I was in the State House, taking notes, listening to people, writing things down, I knew that this was profoundly important. I didn't know where it was going to go, but I kept taking notes. I've always been a note taker. And my <coughs> mother said to me, take typing when I was in high school. And so I can type, and I can watch someone, and I can get down most of what they say. I've also used digital recordings and tape recorders. So I had a wealth of material. I had no idea that we were, we were going to pass separation of powers. I didn't know where things were going to come out, but I realized that it was important stuff to get down, and so I did that. Well, good for you. Uh, it takes discipline to actually have a long-form plan over a long period of time to keep taking the notes. Can well, I, and I had a good editor who said to me early on that in 2009, she said, look, what you're writing is factual, but it, people are going to have trouble reading it because of the way you're writing it. And I was bummed out for a couple of days, and I went back to scratch and then created the kinds of chapters that you're seeing now that are basically thematic about redistricting or about whatever it happens to be. All right. So, I, you know, although it may feel like a wonky exercise, um, there's a lot of historical play by play. And I think people who have just have followed government and, you know, you don't have to be part of the inner circle to understand. We'll read a lot of this and say, because I have gone through it and did some uh, 
the short reading. It's like, oh yeah, I remember that one. Yep. Oh, 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 is that what happened behind that one? I get it. Now. And that's what everybody says who's who's read it. I, a couple of people have said they've read all the way through now. Yeah. But a number of people who were participants are saying to me, you know, I'd almost forgotten about that. Mm. And then some of my students at URI uh, w w said, I was eight years old when RISDIC happened, so I have. I remember how it affected my mother, mm. but it didn't affect me, and I just went to play. I need to know, and that's part of why I started to write it as well. Yeah, so here we are in 2014, and you left Common Cause at, in... 2006. In 2006, so that is exactly the timeline. I mean, I was even around for seven of these years, and there's there's parts of this book where I, I've read through and said, ah, yes, I, oh, that was a good one. And you got a funky picture of me in there anyway, um, um, you know, at the <laughs> Ethics Commission, as a yes. matter of fact. With um, your mouth wide open yeah, you know, as you were trying to get a... Well, I, uh, what did I do to you? I just, uh, <laughs> that was the only picture I had. I, you know, I took pictures where I could. I wound up writing stuff. I wound up taking pictures in places where nobody else was. Uh, and and it was kind of fun, but uh, so I got that picture of you, and I know it's not flattering. Uh, it's, it's and some other sorry. people would say, if you took that picture of me and printed it, I'm never going to talk to you again. Well, well just come on, <laughs> you can't take yourself that seriously. When we come back, I'm going to we're going to break up the conversation on a couple of things: ethics, open government, um, and this thing called separation of powers that he had a lot to do with. Stay with us. That is your. Uh, uh, rather underwhelming state ethics room uh, downtown where so many uh, decisions are made on the behavior and actions of political officials. There's Michael Solomon, the city council president, and once mayoral candidate who got beat in the primary by Jorge Alorza. He recently spent uh, $2,000 reconciling some paperwork. There's Ross Chite, who is one of the uh, principal members of the Ethics Commission, also who actually uh, moderated a debate at Brown University that was controversial. So it seems like all the players sometimes in Rhode Island stories uh, intersect and interact. And I, I don't think we need to pick on Solomon here. He seemed to come to the table understanding that he did not um, appropriately report out some of his business and, and real estate ownership issues. And so, bada boom, you solve it by writing a check. And, and you hope that that's the end of the day. We've had more profound fines, like Gordon Fox's $10,000 fine. Uh, he's probably wishing that was his only problem. Right. Now. Uh, but uh, Phil West is my guest. The book is Secrets and Scandals. And amongst the things that you chronicle over your 20 years is the Ethics Commission doing. So talk to me a little bit about the overall thing you feel about ethics and the Ethics Commission in the states. Well, the, the Ethics Commission is the most powerful ethics such commission in the whole United States in that it has power both to write specific regulations and rules for public officials and then to prosecute those subject to appeal to superior court. So that's an extraordinary power. And the commission began to use that in the 1990s to put in a strong gift rule, to expand nepotism, to block revolving door appointments and so on. And uh, so it, it became a very powerful commission. And then there was an effort from about 1998 to 2000 to stop that and reverse that by appointment of people. And it led to a meltdown where the commission, I won't just try to get into the details now, but it was a crisis. The commission was almost destroyed. And then it took a long time of rebuilding and I'm happy to say that under the present director, Kent Williver, uh, with some very good staff, Kathy DeRezzo, Jason Gramet, some good investigators, they are back and they are doing some good work. It doesn't mean that they are working magic, but they're doing some good well, work. Well, they're doing some good work, and I, I would never discredit the good work that they do because I think they're another one of those staffs that is underpersoned and overwhelmed. But taking a somewhat more recent history uh, about the efforts to hurt the Ethics Commission backwards, the Irons case is the one that, did, that, that just sent a blowhole into the side of the Ethics Commission, and I don't think it's recovered today. Well, and you're absolutely right. It's the Irons decision for your listeners, and maybe I should just explain that briefly, sure. shall I? Yeah. Uh, Bill Irons was the Senate president. He was an insurance broker. He was taking a lot of money from CVS and Blue Cross, but not disclosing it. 
Uh, it led to, it, it, there was a secondary scandal involving John Salona, who had been literally on the payroll for C, from CVS. Uh, Irons left the, the Senate. Uh, he spent three years trying to negotiate the kind of settlement that Anthony Solomon did in, sa in the sense of saying, I will pay some penalty, I will... Michael Solomon. Michael yes. Solomon, yeah. sorry. Thank you. Yeah. That's very important. Yeah. Um, so he spent three years doing that, and then when they wouldn't agree with him, he went to Superior Court. Uh, Judge Darrigan found against him, it went to su Supreme Court, and by a four-to-one ruling, they said that the Ethics Commission did not have authority over legislators. Now the folly of that decision was that that was exactly the intent of the Constitutional Convention in 1986 that of all people in the state that ought to be con dominated or regulated by, the, not dominated, but regulated in regard to conflicts of interest by the Ethics Commission, it was the General Assembly. The phrase that one delegate, Roger Millette, used was that we have to keep the fox away from the hen house. Mm -hmm. And so that's what, that was the goal, and the Irons decision over po uh, overturned it, and Judge Sutel, who was not the Chief Justice at that time, uh, correctly analyzed the problem and gave a very strong dissent, but he was outvoted by the others. Yeah, uh, which makes you feel like this, uh, the Supreme Court, with all due respect, are a bunch of hacks too. Uh, obviously, they find legal rationale to form a decision, but it felt hackorama-ish, and it made Rhode Islanders feel like, what? Is there nowhere left to go now to hold legislators accountable? And you know, John Tarantino, the lawyer for Bill Irons, uh, Irons did a wonderful job in explaining that the speech and debate th and debate clause that a legislator has to use, uh, has to be protected by when acting in official capacity and 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 doing their legislative debate and job needed to be the overriding argument here. And uh, that uh, you know, what they say on the floor has very little to do with whatever backdoor deals are going on and whether bills will be considered. It's interesting that Tarantino made that argument. I know John well. Um, brilliant guy. Brilliant guy, but wrong. Because, and the Supreme Court ruled that since in 1986, in November, the voters approved both a, a rewriting of the Constitution that included the speech and debate clause, which had not been debated at all, hardly mentioned, I think not mentioned really at all, in the Constitutional Convention not mentioned in the voter information booklet. But then they also um, uh, approved the ethics amendment, which had been widely debated, widely discussed, uh, that somehow these were of equal weight. And since they were in conflict, they had to say that the speech and debate clause was older and therefore prevailed. I don't think there was a voter in the state that knew that vote, speech, and debate could be used that way. So it leaves us in a tough spot Terrible right now. spot. And the General Assembly, over five years since then, has refused to allow the voters to make that decision. That what they should do is put on a simple amendment that would uh, basically carve out a narrow exception from speech and debate for legislators. They would not do that year after year after year. It was the Senate leadership that blocked it. And this year, because they were afraid of a constitutional convention, they came out with a Trojan horse amendment that Michael McCaffrey, the Senate Judiciary Committee chair, pushed very hard. It, was, it would have destroyed the Ethics Commission if it had been pre put, presented as a constitutional amendment and passed by the voters. By the way, real quick, on the constitutional convention, because you were here prior, uh, the, poll mom the poll number said, absolutely, this thing is going to pass, and it got thumped. What's your short answer on why that happened? A, a very aggressive campaign based on fear that women's rights to choose would be rolled back. I think that was an unfortunate campaign. I agree. It was a manipulative campaign. I also think that we have a lot of constituents who, when they went to the voting booth, really didn't know what the heck it was. That's right. And that goes to you. And don't take it personally if it's not you, but the one on the couch watching with you. Ask a family member what the Constitutional Convention question number three meant. You'll get some really uncomfortable responses. When we come back, we'll talk about good things that have happened in this last 20 years, including separation of powers, another concept that people go, oh, yeah, and don't know what it is. Stay with us. <laughs> so the book is called Secrets and Scandals. Phil West, who ran Common Cause, a very important organization, uh, 
is the author. It's it's a great history book. It's a, but it's not it's not it's not a Roger Williams type history book. For those of you who get bored by way back when, you know it's not the kind of thing that Link Chafee necessarily would curl up with exclusively. I think you could curl up with it and say, oh, I remember that story all the way back to RISD, uh, which is one of our major cataclysmic. You know, holy cow. Um, uh, things, but let, let's talk about something that was was good. You and Common Cause worked very hard on this concept of separation of powers. To this day, I'm quite certain that most people don't even know what the problem was and what the solution is. But take the floor on that for a couple of minutes. Real, real quick. Back to the Royal Charter of 1663. Oh, you are going to go back all the way well, to I'll, 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 try, right. I'll try to do it quickly. <laughs> the, uh, the Charter created the General Assembly as the government of Rhode Island gave it all sorts of power to appoint judges, to appoint um, boards, to do all sorts of things. And um, I won't go try to go through all the details, but the People's Con Constitution of 1841, Thomas Dore, tried to establish a constitution with universal suffrage and separation of powers. Separation of powers was the concept that the founders of this country put into a form that really could work. There had been ideas of it in England before that, but they made it work. And they simply said, the only way to protect people from tyranny and government is to separate three kinds of power, legislative power over here, executive power over here, judicial power over here, and that if those powers are against each other and they have a turf war, that will lead, it, it, we, it'll stop government from doing crazy things or stupid things. Right. And, and the concept of checks and balances. Checks and balances was the key. All right, so almost, you, you, get that on a, you get that on a national basis, but, but the, the, the concept here was that we really, we had a little bit of a, a messy line here in Rhode Island. Well, we really didn't have a line at all. Okay. The legislature still ran everything. And so, for instance, the State Lottery Commission, nine members, three, senators appointed by the Senate Majority Leader, three representatives appointed by the Speaker of the House, three public members appointed by the Governor with confirmation by the Senate appointed, appointed by the Governor. There was not in the whole rest of the country even one board that supervised gambling that had even one sitting legislator as a member, but here we had a majority. The same thing for the board that controlled pay raises for the director, the, uh, the chair of the Public Utilities Commission, and for judges, and for other state department directors. So, so quickly, what did it do? So it, that gave a, a great opportunity for patronage, but also for control. When Jim Malachowski, who was the head of the Public Utilities Commission in the early 1990s, and protected ratepayers from great increases by, for instance, the Narragansett Bay Commission, or when he stood up against George Carullo's legislation in 1996, uh, that would uh, have deregulated electricity but had all sorts of built-in protections for what was the, later became National Grid, uh, the un they used the unclassified pay plan board to cut his salary and drive him out of government. That's how you send the message. So your work, the outcome is? After, in 1999, 15 years ago, June 29, 1999, the Supreme Court, by a four-to-one majority, said Rhode Island doesn't have separation of powers, has never had separation of powers, and it's not even an appropriate question for us. And at that point, we said it's now from here on, it's a full-scale battle, and we've got to convince people in Rhode Island. I didn't know if I would live to see the end of it. But gradually, people began to say, we understand that that's what America's about. We want some separation of powers, like the other states and like the federal government. And then, just as we were beginning to get head of steam, Governor Rahman put two questions on the ballot. The Senate began to come around, and then we had the Wendy Collins scandal in the summer of 2002. And that opened the door for passage of separation of powers. All right, read about it. Now, we only have a couple minutes left. Open government theme here. Give me, give me, give me 90 seconds from what the book will tell us about open government. Pensions were secret until 19, the early, 1991, you could not find out the name of anybody who had a, a, was getting a state pension or how much it was. Kathy Gregg reported for the Providence Journal 
broke a series of stories in March of 1991 called Set for Life. And that series, published one, two, three, four, five stories in two days, revealed people who had never worked for the state who were getting state pensions, people who were getting, had all sorts of fire sale buy-ins but would take huge payout. We're still paying for some of those pensions. Mm. Some of those got evicted when Nancy Mayer was general treasurer and she really worked, went to work on this. And so what was the, what, in but, short, or what was the change that occurred from that? Well, Kathy Gregg broke that open and the law was changed in 1991 to say that we, those things related to state, state benefits that have to do with particular individuals can be revealed now. Hmm. I'll tell you, the, it's still though, even with some of the reforms and the transparency where you can look up who's making what, no doubt, the culture of pensions in this state is unbelievable. Well, and it'll take time to change. Uh, it's changing. Uh, I, would say, I would say to you, Dan, that without four-year terms, which passed in 1992 as a constitutional amendment, and without separation of powers, Gina Raimondo could not have led the charge for pension reform in 2011. All right, listen, there's no way I can cover the whole book in the short period of time that we have on the show, but you'll come back often as things from history reflect on current events, won't you? I'll be honored. All right, go get the book. Where can you get the book, real quick? Local bookstores, and it's going to go on Amazon after Thanksgiving. All right, one more thing. Well, Phil reminds me that the story behind the story and how that story about pensions was broken is in the book, so you got to read the book, Secrets and Scandals. You know, I love shows like this. Call me if you've got a long-form conversation that you want to have on a day when we can do that. Here's how you get in touch with us, 228-1886 is the voicemail, leave it for Jess and she'll relay the message, unless you say something that you want on the air and we'll know the difference. Email us at stateofmindatmyritv.com and Facebook and Twitter and all that kind of thing. All right, I hope you had a great holiday. Uh, we will reconvene on Monday and I'll see you on the radio at noontime. Taking your call, feel free on WPRO. Thanks for watching. Good night.